production of Golden Thread Productions has been able to accomplish through the forum, and I've been honored to be a part of this process. So thank you. And um, of course, we extend a thanks to all of you for, for attending and participating. Um, so uh, without further ado, the last finale of the weekend with our very own Toran Giegi Azorian uh, um, chairing the last panel from War on Drugs to War on Terror Parallels in Chicano, Latino, and Middle East American Performance. And I'll briefly um, introduce the panelists and they will say more about themselves, I'm sure, or Toran will. So we have joining us Angela Marino, um, Roberto Varela, and Octavio Solis. So let's give them a welcoming round of applause. Um, great, so um, a little bit of background on um, where this panel topics <coughs> came from. Um, we at Golden Thread are very interested in the intersection of cultures. We define the Middle East inclusively and broadly, and we um, acknowledge and pay rev reverence to um, all the various cultures uh, that are represented in the Middle East, that the Middle East has influenced and have influenced the Middle East. And one of them is very much the Latino culture. Obviously, there is the shared history of uh, Andalusia and the uh, presence of Islam uh, in Spain, uh, which I think uh, our panelists will speak about more. But in more recent history, uh, when I first came to the U.S. as a teenager, uh, in the aftermath of revolution in my own country, I was looking for other revolutionaries in, in the U.S. and the revolutionaries at the time were either from uh, Central America and Latin America or uh, Palestinians fighting for independence. So. Um, those two communities are the communities that really informed my um, sensibility in my early years in the U.S. And I was very struck by how um, people around me, my family, um, didn't really um, connect with what was happening in Central America and Latin America. Uh, and even then, as a teenager, it really seemed pretty obvious to me that if something like this can be done to one group of people. At some point, it can also be done to your group of people, which is exactly what happened, because um, in the 80s, uh, the Reagan White House uh, waged the war on drugs uh, on Central America, basically, um, Nicaragua, El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, um, you know, fighting communism in the guise of war on drugs. And, a similar thing happened right after 9-11 under the um, umbrella of war on terror. Um, so for me, there is a parallel there as well as um, our two people's sort of common journey as immigrant populations in the U.S. and how Chicano and Latino theater has been able to establish itself as a voice uh, in American theater and what that how that can inform uh, what Middle Eastern American playwrights are uh, going through and what's ahead, maybe some strategies. And so with that um, introduction, I'd like to hand it over to Angela Marino, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, um, professor of Heather. <laughs> Is it? Is she? No. But she's in the theater and dance department. Mm -hmm. And um, you will say more about her own background and then go right into your presentation. Um, sure, I'm an assistant professor. I have the great honor of working with people like Heather. We have a terrific program at UC Berkeley. Um, and this year, um, in addition to a number of classes that are dealing with issues that we've talked about, um, colonialism, decoloniality, um, race, empire, other kinds of courses that are offered through the graduate program and our undergraduate program, um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for being here for initiating this kind of conversation. Um, because I do feel like this kind of conversation that brings a kind of South to South um, in a global more context, um, it's urgent that we start to um, think about what is going on in our wartime present and the strategies that these different communities have had to engage with in order to um, 
survived really over centuries. And so I think we're also talking about a long history and also the trajectory of our future. Um, so we're talking here at a time, obviously, where the stakes are really high. Um, we have extremely large and diverse communities of people that we're talking about. And we don't think we're really looking at just trying to find colonial equivalences here. Um, but we do find that there are some shared experiences that can help us identify kind of who are we, what are we dealing with? You know, what is this, um, what generates these structures of power or the way that wars um, have been perpetuated for, for so many years, um, and particularly in moment now. So we see Latinos, Middle East people in this country rounded up in the same prisons, in the same detention centers. Um, we see people held at the borders. We see people profiled in searches and otherwise policed in unprecedented proportions in this country. Uh, so I'm going to ask if the, if the slides can come on for for one minute. I'll get to the um, the play where this image here is taken from in a few minutes. Um, but I want to focus at first on this kind of idea of the state of crisis that we're finding ourselves in and to um, think about the hope that we have in the theater to strategically expose um, what is at times these absurd but also very real underpinnings of racist ideology that we can see through economy and that um, is also expose the ways that the economy, institutions such as Homeland Security kind of depend on the fall by. Um, they need to show an enemy in order to substantiate their own existence as protectors and ultimately producers um, of what more and more feels like an illusion of democracy. Um, so I'm going to refer to this play a little later that I think does, does that work um, called the, the Eleven Entrance of, of Chad Deity by Christophe uh, Yes. Um, so the second slide. So, Jose Padilla, who prosecutors swore to lock up no matter what, and the what being torture, paltry evidence, failure of any semblance of legal rights, became this kind of repeating mirror of what Time Magazine called it, the sum of all fears. Um, so the Time Magazine reporters were sure to point out that what that meant was the Latino ex-gang member, ex-con, turned Muslim, who potentially hates the good people of the United States. I think what we missed from that report was the extent to which Paglia and his case kind of reflected this, um, the, the construct itself, um, this extension of the centuries old match between good and evil, you know, um, the, the so-called evil that you know, led these crusades really to this hemisphere, to steal and hoard from its people here in this hemisphere, and ultimately what supports the 1.2 billion sorry, trillion dollar industry of war that steals and hoards from us, the taxpayer. Um, so uh, I want to point out here, some of the audience here, my um, compañero Roberto Lovato who's working in immigrant rights and um, has really informed me a lot in his thinking also to consider that immigration is a part of the Homeland Security um, you know, as an institution. So we need to keep that in mind that um, immigration is directly at the core of these institutional frameworks. Um, so, one of the shifts that we saw in terms of this idea of the ongoing crusade is in the 1990s when there was a kind of military activism where this idea that we had to go meet the enemy wherever they are. Um, and again, it's a kind of extension I mean, this, of this missionary project to go out and meet people that you had to convert. Um, you know, that, that was the, 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 you know, the, the grand income for us or the, you know, the conquest period. Um, so, out of that we had plays, I think in the late 1990s, that were these millennial plays, and one that I want to show you just a poster image of next, of Marisol by Jose Rivera. Um, and in this play, it takes place in New York, and it's an apocalyptic upheaval where Marisol, who is a young professional Latina working for a publishing firm, has to shake herself out of this denial that the world is, in every sense, has gone out of whack. You know, it's just, there's imbalance everywhere. 
So Marisol, in the next two plays, I'm going to mention if you give us a chance to see how these cultural reorientations um, work for worldviews. And I think that might be one of the parallel moves that's going on with the new plays um, and also with some of the work that the festival is doing. Where in this case, the history and future imagination is altered in Marisol from this God in Revelations that takes up arms to defend chosen believers against all others. Um, in this play, Marisol joins a band of women and angels that fight to save the world um, by bringing back the moon when it's the sun, this incessant sun, that has symbolized empire and patriarchy and going all the way back, you know, um, to Charlemagne, I don't know if somebody mentioned him in the last panel, um, where, and in this play, God has disappeared from the action altogether. Um, so instead, we're left with a millennial kind of apocalyptic narrative of a very different sort than what we saw in Revelations in the first century AD. And I think what's at stake in this play is really an answer to the so-called kind of mythic clash of civilizations, where it actually finds that apocalypse is a self-fulfilling prophecy called into question. It's not one that's necessarily you know, propelled by this essential conflict between two groups of people. Um, rather that if there is a central conflict, it's because there's an unsustainable empire that's afflicted by disaster, capitalism, kind of um, uneven development, unfair management of resources, and so on. So Marisol reorients this from the center of apocalypse, as Revelation tells it, where God is this punitive reminder that some will sin and go to hell, and others will come obey and be saved, um, to an altogether very different center in the idea of community, and rebirth, and renewal. Um, and so it's all about trying to reachieve re balance and equilibrium. And so, in this play, I think there's also, when we tie the science together, we find that she's actually connecting to the Popol Vuh. So, these are, these are belief systems through the Americas, indigenous belief systems, that are a very, a very, this is a strong center, I think, from which Latino and Chicano playwrights are speaking from, is the combination, you know, having to contend with the multiple um, ways that Catholicism has been imprinted, imposed, and has become a part of who we are. But at the same time, finding the sources and inspirations for our history and also our future in indigenous thoughts and belief systems and ways that we can express that through our plays. Um, so in this next slide of the, um, the Popol Vuh, we can see that a group like Teatro Campesino, which has decades um, of of theater history work here in the larger Bay Area. Um, and it's a beautiful play telling the story of the people who, for mostly Latino audiences in a public park setting, San Juan Bautista, California. It's outdoors, there's giant puppet figures. These are coming out of you know, long practices of fiesta traditions in the Americas. There are narrations in multiple languages, including Nahuatl, uh, indigenous languages, and the staging of theater in the sphere. Right, it's intergenerational and so forth. So in another example, there's an image of a poster for a play by one of the foremost um, theater companies. So I'm going to switch and I give you a perspective of one play from, from South America here. Um, and this is a theater company called Yuyashikami, which is a catch-all word, and it means I remember through you. And this play turns the story of Santiago Matamoros and Santiago Mataindios, so the, the Moor Slayer and the Indian Slayer, um, into one of memory and reversal. So where the patron of the fiesta, the caretaker of the church, switch roles in this play. Um, and they end up kind of upturning this whole conquest narrative. And they literally spin the horse. So, um, it's, I, I'm going to take you just a little bit through these because I think we're also going to have another reference to Santiago and the importance of this symbol um, through where Roberto is going to present. So, the next slide shows you these images of St. James, of Santiago, St. James. So, this is the, the legend of the Battle of Clavijo in Spain, in which the miraculous appearance of St. James in the battlefield terrified the Muslim forces inspired Spanish to victory, thus misstating 
this reigning figure of Santiago in iconography, a kind of righteous religious dominion of Christians over Muslims from the 9th century to the final expulsion of the Muslim people from their lands in Spain in 1492. Um, so in some cases, and then it's like the, just like the repeating mirror of Paella, we see this nearly identical story repeated in Cusco, Peru. So in this case, Santiago is the killer of the Indians, so it becomes Mataindios, or the indigenous who are now the new target, but part of the same mechanism of this imperial domination. So there's Santiago and the horse, you can see in this play that Yerushchami did, by spinning the horse and kind of refusing to be either on the top or the bottom was a strategy, a way of questioning this entire um, mechanism of imperial domination. Um, so, next I want to get to what I promised at the beginning of the slide, uh, which is this play, The Elaborate Entrance of Chad Giri. So, this is a play by a young Puerto Rican, Macedonia Guerra, who's coming out of the Bronx with a childhood born passion for the wrestling ring. So, he becomes mates, working for the white producer as basically the Latino fall guy for this rig match with the star of the show, African-American Chad Beatty, until Mace teams up with this fast-talking East Indian kid from Brooklyn, and the two of them devise the ultimate terror. So here they are, the Che, Rebel, Zapatista, Pancho Villa, border crossing migrant, the Mexican planted next to the Bin Laden look alike, <laughs> right? Brooklyn born hip hop fly guy, they figure out how to make the bomb as the ultimate threat. So if you might guess the name of the um, of, of his Brooklyn friend is the fundamentalist. And him the Mexican, right? And all of these different investments in either maintaining or tearing down this fantasy of the match that's increasingly kind of built up in tensions throughout the rest of the play. So I think in the next slide, I think what's interesting here is that Diaz doesn't shy away from complexity. So instead he's, kind of, he's embracing complexity. The game he contends is in all of us as children exposed to the play, at times building alternative imaginations inside of it, and we're also influenced into blindness and rationalizations of this game. Nevertheless, he suggests that there's a strength to be on the inside of it. There's a strength in his perspective as actors, as producers, inside of this spectacle of power. And so to see its operations in order to expose it and potentially turn, turn it upside down. So another tactic worth noting in this play, and this will be my last point before summing up, is the staging of this entire apparatus of the spectacle in Shad Beauty. So it's a mass by these ladders and lights, the ringing of the match. We're constantly reminded of this outside of the spectacle, the lights and the whistles that make it glow. And we're given plenty of conflict time with the white producer that's willing to reverse the roles and spin each character onto the other just to keep the ratings high for this production of the wrestling match. And so that's what makes this, I think, very really fascinating as a metaphor for the media industrial state complex as a spectacle of power. Um, so, um, so in sum, a play like Marisol and Popovu, I think the attempt to recenter a historiographic lineage of Chicano and Latin plays to cultural identifications that have contested this worldview of the clash of civilizations. Um, and plays such as Yoshkani's Santiago literally spin the entire course to suggest this popular dismantling of colonial domination. And popular is important here because it's a fiesta, so there are many people involved in that process. And then in, in third, that plays in the US such as Diaz's elaborate entrance of child deity bring this entire spectacle into view um, as a means to challenge the mock media battles of racist ideologies that play out in, in war and terror and war and drugs, um, and simultaneously on immigration and other so-called you know, protectionist policies in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. So our format's going to be each speaker will speak uh, 
um, for seven to ten minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, because I think we want to. Yes? Ten, ten to twelve minutes. Um, we are really interested in your um, your participation in this conversation. So. Roberto is a professor at uh, University of San Francisco and a dear friend, if I may, um, and a lover of wine, which always is good. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is Aurelian for an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. Uh, I'm not. So, uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, am, I am happy to be here. Uh, some thoughts with you, and I'm and, um, and happy because at some point uh, this conversation over wine, uh, we, we dreamt up uh, with the ranch, I guess we were drinking so much we forgot about it, I guess you were. And, um, and of course also something that is uh, to the degree, uh, to the uh, painful degree, uh, relevant to what's going on today, uh, Orange visited my Latino performance class and uh, my Latino performance and folk course for the reading of the Gaza monologues. And, and, and it was really interesting to be to see that as, a, as an important space um, where theater occupies uh, in both cultures. So I am a rambling man, so I, I put some thoughts on, on paper and just keep doing my and, and it's more of an introduction, I think I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, so there's a personal dimension to this, and that, of course, as, a, as a, someone <coughs> born and raised in Latin America, coming in, in, in migrated to the United States, embraced uh, and uh, mutually embraced the Latino, Chicano community here, the, uh, the theater community in particular, uh, becoming a Latino, and uh, although some of my, uh, that's an important distinction, uh, if, but some of you have questions about that, maybe we can talk about that too, but uh, I, I will focus on, all, on, on examples that relate a little bit more to Chicano theater, not to Latino theater, as you know, in case of Marisol, in the way. So, uh, uh, Los Moros y Los Morenos is the, the title of my book. Uh, so, when, when pondering the question of Middle Eastern theater similarities with Chicano Latino theater, the first image that came to mind to me was that of Juan de Oñate, the commander of the colonial force that moved from what is today's Mexican territory to claim lands to the north for the Spanish crown. This was a rough campaign, as there was a little silver or gold to be found, we had to put down mutinies and other forms of discontent, primarily uh, amongst those who objected to being discovered, like the Hopi, the Pueblo, and other nations. Uh, in 1598, to celebrate a spell of good fortune, after having crossed the Rio Grande next to today's uh, El Paso, hometown of Octavio, uh, in Texas, he staged the pageant Los Moros y los Cristianos, the Christians and the Moors, a play that glorified the reconquista or reconquering uh, uh, of the land held for more than 700 years by the Moors in the Iberic Peninsula. We will say that Oñate cast local native people as the Moors which may or may have not happened, but it is clear by the abundant colonial iconography that uh, we saw before, uh, throughout the Americas, particularly in Latin America, that this actually took place in Spanish active colonial imaginations. Santiago, a.k.a. Uh, St. James, the Christian patron saint whose name became the battle cry uh, going into battle against the Moor for the Spanish, for the Spanish army, um, Change is known the guerra from Santiago Matamoros or the Moor Slayer to Santiago Mata Indios or the Indian Slayer. So, images of Santiago at the his wife's horse, uh, serenely trampling on the Moors, were changed by thousands of religious images of the holy gallant jockey and his mount trampling on native people. The mold for the soldier, saint slash conqueror's superiority and duty to rule over the darker skinned other on the one hand, and the latter's death sentence as infidel determined by the true God on the other, was thus cast in the Americas, a burden that in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War was taken up by the United States, a nation that synthesized the term America to be applied just to itself, 
as opposed to the whole continent, and continued its own expansionism under the quasi-religious ideology of manifest destiny, uh, aptly put by the Monroe Doctrine, America for the Americans, in that moment. I was born in Córdoba, Córdoba de la Nueva Andalucía, that is the, like New York City, you know, uh, from the old York in Europe, this, my hometown is Córdoba de la, of the New Andalucía, and uh, a, a city that's also reverenced with the family memory, because my, my grandfather Varea, who came from Andalucía, born very close to Córdoba um, in Spain, uh, his last name was Varea Moreno, uh, uh, which Moreno comes from Moore, and, and he, uh, according to my mom, because I never met him, he died when my mom was young, uh, was very proud to refer him with himself as an Arab. Uh, there's some photos of my grandfather that actually, you know, I don't know, it's, it's funny to look at, for example, this Peña Chicarinian project that if you put a sombrero on a Middle Eastern person, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, so that was the case with my, my grandfather. I am, I am, as you can see, from the lighter side of the family, right, the skin side of the family. Um, so Cordoba was Kudua, so it was the, the head of the Caliph of Cordoba. And it's important to remember this because um, at the time of the, the, the 10th, 11th century, it was not only the most populous city in, in, in the Western world, in, 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 the, in Europe, uh, but it was uh, considered to be the most cultured people in the world. Uh, it was the largest, the largest um, um, library since Alexandria had been assembled in Cordoba, where hundreds of thousands of volumes and all sorts of things came from. And of course, if we, if we, it's important to remember this to a degree, because Anglo history does not much cover that. Uh, Spanish history did not cover much of that either, because the Moors were the, were the vanquished. And, but for a degree, a revisionist. Uh, a look at, uh, at colonial history in Latin America, in Argentina in particular, where I studied, uh, brought this to light. And of course, the military in 1976, when they uh, went over everything uh, and, and, and uh, looking for subversive thought that included Latiric, Latin, America, Latin Americanismo, or anything that spoke to a larger Latin American consciousness, censored all the references to the, to the, the achievements of the Moors in Spain. And, you know, this is the town where Seneca was born, because that's it from, from Roman times, the poet uh, uh, Lucan, and of course Averroes. How do you pronounce that? Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi. Ibn Arabi. Are you familiar with this person? Yes. Because we, we, we owe. Ibn Rush? Yes. Ibn Rush. Who's Ibn Arabi? We say Avicenas or Averroes in Spanish. Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina. It's Avicenna. Yeah. Okay. A, a philosopher, scientist, a, a, an incredible mind to whom we all really like to, to, to the Arab culture at the time, uh, basically the, the, the keeping the, the, of the foundations of Western thought, because these were the people that were keeping uh, all of this, the Greek philosophers' ideas, uh, recopying them, commenting them, and of course, our voice comments from Aristotelian philosophy are, are, are critical to understanding Aristotle. So, um, let me see where I was at. Uh, by, so, so Latinos, by extension, then are, are the repository of so much Arab Muslim culture that its own rise to, to I mean, this, that Spain's own rise to world superpower following the defeat of the Moors would have not happened without its influences in thought, science, and art. Uh, our common words are referring to cultural trappings like like camisa, pantalón, zapato. Uh, anything that starts with al, like alfombra, almohada, you know, pillow, carpet, sh uh, shoes, pants, uh, shirts, all of these are, in the Spanish language, are Arab words. Granada falls uh, to the Spanish armies in 1492, which, not by coincidence, is the year that Columbus sails the ocean blue. So the idea of the native as the Moor of Nueva España lays the grounds for the narrative of liberation via religious conversion that makes the genocidal brutality of the Spanish invasions, so-called discovery or conquest, a much better oiled machinery. And of course, the theater was at the heart of it. Los Moros y los Cristianos became the first European theatrical performance in what is today the land of the United States of America. In Diana Taylor's words, a theater of oppression, 
later to be confronted by a theater of the oppressed, a term coined by Augusto Roal, but here applied in a larger sense, a theater born out of the necessity to affirm our own culture, language, memory, and experience through a counter-narrative to that of hegemonic power. In other words, a narrative of resistance to vilification, stereotyping, and other violent forms of reductionism, transforming to one of self-definition, inquiry, examination, and yes, celebration. We can trace an arc of, uh, or the direction of Chicano Latino theater by connecting a few dots uh, allowed by time, uh, which is uh, very tricky, and ask, uh, asking for forgiveness uh, for our omissions and tale here, but. But we know the birth of Chicano theater will forever be connected with Luis Valdez. We see in the early actos of the Teatro Campesino, a theater born fiercely along the lines of oppositional agit prop, blending not French farce, as in the case of Al Hakim's War and Peace from the, the, the festival, but Italian Commedia dell'arte with Brecht and Lerch took it less in place that perhaps Mansour and Manasseh's letter is also indebted to. The, the next landmark in our art moves us onto a more elaborate narrative of contestation and denunciation. Teatro de Denuncia, as it's referred to in Latin America, with works such as El Teatro de la Esperanza, La Victima, uh, The Victim, No Saco Nada de la Escuela, I Get Nothing Out of School. Teams present in this stage find interesting parallels with Middle Eastern theater as this work bring forth the first uh, full formal use of bilinguality in Chicano theater. By that I mean not only the issue of bilinguality as part of the resistance to, to one language, one thought, machinery of assimilation, but the aesthetic and expressive potential of Spanish clashing with English, and of course the code switching and other borderings of language uh, that are part of the Latino culture in the U.S. Borrowing from Professor Davachi's uh, pr presentation yesterday, the mongrel form of expression, mongrels form of expression, or to follow Taylor here as well, the Calibanization of language, just in Caliban from, from so the monstrous other of the Tempest. It is important here to acknowledge the connection between Latino Chicano theater and Latin American theater, long engaged in anti-colonial cultural resistance projects that really blossomed during this time, particularly through the Tenaz movement, which in the early 70s brought about meaningful dialogue and collaborations, and with this engagement with the Latin American colleagues and the creative, uh, uh, the collective creative process of being perfected in Latin America, the people that were in in Colombia, and so forth, uh, which of course influenced theater worldwide, including very much in the United States. Anti-war works are central to this period, not only marked by the Vietnam War as interesting parallel with places we saw yesterday and. Chicano uh, classics like uh, um, Dark Root of the Scream or Soldado Raso, uh, that by Luis Valdez, but by one of the most, uh, not only by the Vietnam War, but by one of the most violent chapters in the United States relationship with so called backyard, a term that refers to a good portion of the continent uh, south of the Rio Grande, that even uh, Barack Obama used to refer to Latin America. This brings up another interesting parallel between Latin America and the Middle East, marking the coming of age of the CIA in the context of the Soviet Union. The coup d'etat that brought down Mossadegh in 1953 to protect the Anglo Persia oil company and other imperial holdings in the region was followed by the coup that ousted President Jacobo Arbenz in 1954 to protect primarily the United Fruit Company's obscene hold on land and exception for taxation in Guatemala. The legacy of both of these simultaneously orchestrated CIA groups can be counted by in hundreds of thousands of deaths. The official numbers for Guatemala alone are over 250,000. And we're talking about official numbers, right? And also of countless displaced people, many of whom migrated to the United States, seeking some form of safe, safe, safe haven. The war on drugs conducted by the U.S., which has rippled from Peru in Bol in, and Bolivia in the 70s, before it became more notorious, to Colombia in the 80s, and now in Mexico, has left a violent toll of pornographic proportion. Pornographic both in scope and in regards to the explicit staging of mutilated bodies and death. That in Mexico alone, in fewer than six years, or again, officially, has already topped 60,000 deaths. Just as with the campaigns to pacify or to democratize the Middle East, the Latin American war on drugs had much more to do, has much more to do, to do with who owns
owns or controls the land and its resources than fighting the drug dealers. As a war on drugs, it has been an absolute failure. But as a land and resources war, it has been incredibly successful. Chicano Latino theater, as well as Perry, <laughs> continues to mature into more reflective processes of cultural expression. And in doing so, as Professor Davashi so eloquently put it, it has also continued to tend and chip away the bulletproof armor of Anglo heteronormativity. This has occurred in a number of ways, but I will mention a couple. A more elaborate manifestation of his native roots and consciousness, known as indigenismo, which brings us full circle back to processes of resistance to colonization, and also by taking on controversial issues within the community, such as domestic abuse, rape, uh, homosexuality, as in the works of Cherie Moraga, Shadow of the Man, Years and Saints, and now more recently, New Fire, which is ritual in form. Um, of course, the inclusion of indigenous languages in the work, the work of Luis Alfaro, the performance art of Guillermo Gomez Peña, we're talking about the Chicarinian project, you can look up online. Uh, a, good, a good example of this way of Chicano drama blossoming in new, in new works that master, master stage language and complex storylines is my, my, my co panelist Octavio Solis' Lidia. A sort of high hanging fruit nurtured on the sap of Chicano themes and forms that ripens around the loaded paradigm and metaphor of the border. The border, not just, which is central, of course, to Octavius' work, where with not, not just as dividing line, but, but itself made strange and, and as unsettling meeting place, where cultural plate frictions and trespassings between U.S. and Mexico, which is also the border between the U.S. and the rest of Latin America, European and the European and indigenous, the documented and the undocumented, the straight and the queer, the many truths and the many lies that we even tell ourselves, bears great performance. Ultimately, the border as the most fertile ecosystem for creative expression of a consciousness rooted in difference and not in exceptionalism. And thank you. Thank you. As you um, gather from Roberto's um, presentation, he was instrumental in developing this panel. Uh, and that conversation over wine, I think, really <laughs> did, its, did its job. So thank you so much for that. that was um, and Octavio, uh, you're a playwright, local Bay Area. Um, and uh, Lydia, I think Roberto has also <laughs> already introduced you. Do you want to just take it away? Sure. Um, I'm a playwright, uh, and I've been working here in the Bay Area since 1989. And uh, but I come, as Roberto intimated, from El Paso. That's that's my pedigree. That's where my parents moved to from Mexico. That's where I was born and raised. And that's where uh, I, uh, when I, whenever I write, I always dream that landscape again and go back there again for the fertile stories of my imagination. Uh, and. Uh, it's funny that you should mention Oñate uh, in, in, in quite that detail, because El Paso does have a very, very complicated relationship with Oñate. He is credited with naming the city itself, El Paso del Norte, uh, finding that passage through the mountains that leads further north. Uh, uh, but he was also notorious. He was a notorious man who instituted a policy of, uh, of subjugation against the native populations there um, by uh, uh, having the, the, the male, uh, um, anyone who ran away, anyone who uh, rebelled against his forces, uh, the, the children, the male children and the male adults had their left foot cut off. Uh, and so he went down in history as really one of the most brutal uh, oppressors of, 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 of North America. Uh, and yet, there was a, uh, uh, a statue that was commissioned uh, of him. And, and it, curiously enough, you, you show these equestrian uh, images of Santiago. Well, it's, uh, they, they have uh, erected a, a large, uh, um, the largest, in fact, in the world, the largest equestrian statue of Moñate that is now uh, situated at the airport in El Paso. Uh, and it, it, it's part
part of a series of uh, all the important figures in El Paso who are part of that very troubled history. And there was a, a movement to even uh, not even have that statue built at all, but uh, because it seemed to celebrate him, it seemed to sort of uh, honor him. And there's plaques everywhere about him, all over, wherever you go in El Paso, uh, because he sort of founded the first settlement there. And that play that he put on is the first play that was ever performed in the continental U.S. Uh, and it's, it's curious to me how, and, and, and somehow appropriate that it would be the first uh, theater of oppression that was performed there. So, uh, well, well said, sir. Very well said. But that's part of the complexity, I think, that uh, I, I have to deal with whenever I, I go back to El Paso and I write about that, that area. One of the very first plays that I wrote was called Santos and Santos. Its very first performances were here in this very space. And it was based on uh, the Chagra brothers of El Paso, Texas in the 70s, who were a very celebrated, uh, flamboyant uh, uh, legal family of uh, Lebanese, uh, Lebanese in origin, who uh, were heroes in the community, but somehow got mixed up with the narcotics trade. Um, and since then, I have ever been very interested uh, in how, how that narcotics trade, how that border, and, and how immigration have, uh, have touched the lives of, of, of people in El Paso, and by extension, uh, the rest of America. And, and, uh, and I've come full circle. The last couple of works I have been working on, which uh, two are commissions for Yale Rep, and one is a commission for the Magic Theater, touch upon uh, go back to those themes. And the one that I'm working now uh, at the moment uh, is a commission for Yale Rep, and it's a, uh, and, and it's called Sicario. Sicario is a Spanish word for assassin. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it's the first play that I'm writing that deals directly with the, uh, with the cartel violence, the, the horrific brand um, new violence uh, that is overwhelming all of Mexico, but really has completely uh, uh, buried uh, the city of Juarez with, with so many bodies. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a tough work to write about because it's, it's, it is so brutal, it is so horrific, uh, and it's so complex. There are no simple answers, there are no simple uh, enemies to, to point at, there's no like black and white kind of portrait you can sort of develop about that. Um, and on top of that, I have to deal with the prism of being, uh, I, I see the play through the prism of my being an American. And, write, and, and, and now I'm writing about another country, and people in another country. But it's, uh, but Juarez is a city that I feel tremendous kinship to. It's a city where my parents live. It's a city where I still have relatives. City, city uh, we visited often, um, even up to a few years ago. Uh, but it's a city that I can't go to anymore. Uh, and my parents forbid me to enter there. Uh, my brother, who is a defense attorney in El Paso, Texas, won't go there and says, if you go, you're coming back in a box. It's really treacherous, very dangerous city. And yet, in the city of one million, there are people that have to live there day to day and conduct their lives normally. Um, but I have that prism as an American to deal with when I write there. And, and I have, and, and it's a little uh, like, like that, that Rumi fable we saw earlier, uh, that, that story about uh, the elephant and how everyone touches one part and they define it according to what they know without one aspect, without seeing the entire picture. Well, we're just not even getting the entire picture of it right now. Uh, it's just looked upon as, as a law enforcement issue, a law enforcement problem, but it's really, really much more complex than that. It, it touches on, on so many socioeconomic factors, human factors, spiritual factors, and they all have to come into play in this work, which, you know, at first I was thinking it's got to be a tragedy, it's got to be some immense tragedy. But the more I wrote and the more research I did, the more I found that it was turning into a farce. It's just so ridiculous and so laughable that I said, the only way I'm going to get through this is if I think of it as a kind of comedy. Because <laughs> um, it's, it's just, uh, the, the violence is so, so outrageous. And, 
And so uh, you write pornographic. The uh, only way I could sort of imagine it is to write it as a kind of comedy. Um, and here's one example. In, in the year 2010, there were over 3,000 deaths in Juarez. And that kind of comes to like, you know, 19 deaths per 100, uh, 100 people uh, in the city in a year. And, and, and 19 deaths per 100,000 per capita. It's, it's just, it, it's, it's unimaginable in the city of, a, of over a million people. Uh, nothing like that has ever happened in this country in that scale, uh, short of the Civil War. Um, except in the, in the 10 years after its, its cessation from 1869 to 1879 in Louisiana, uh, did we see any kind of violence on that scale. Uh, and, uh, and yet El Paso, at the same time, the year 2010, was uh, voted by Condé Nast as the safest city in America. The safest city in America. There were five homicides that year, over the entire year. And why? Why? It, it, with, with a city with a, a river separating it, where it has not the violence, has, why hasn't the violence spilled over in this country? When a lot of those narcotics are actually, a, a lot of these cartels are fighting to get across this nation, uh, across the river, into this nation for their sake. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of all that, a, a lot of research on that, and I'm trying to find my way through. And, um, and that's, uh, that's one of the works I'm, I'm working on. Another one that I'm writing, for the Magic Theater, it's called Sunset, and it's about my neighborhood, Sunset District. In fact, mm -hmm. it's part of my mission to try to write a play about every major neighborhood in San Francisco. Uh, I've got several already, uh, and, and this one is for the Magic, and uh, and it touches on that. Uh, it's about the paranoia of uh, of that uh, of, of the violence and how it sort of uh, creeps into one's uh, soul, even if it doesn't happen. Even if it isn't directly there in the neighborhood, I, I, I was touched by a story I read about uh, editors who were being killed by uh, sicarios, uh, cartel members, uh, for writing negative stories about uh, the cartels who were being assassinated on the street and, uh, and told to, pop, to to not write about any of the violence at all. Um, and then I was also touched by uh, the murder in, in, in Tehran. Uh, Nita, who, who uh, achieved a kind of some symbolic status after her murder, um, and I and, and I kind of brought those two things together to tell a story in which uh, um, an Iranian professor who has fled the country and is now teaching here in, in San Francisco has a manuscript by a young poet uh, who is like Nita uh, that he uh, swore to her that he would translate and publish in his country. But because he is afraid of some repercussion to him or his relatives back in Iran, he won't do it. He won't do it. So he keeps it hidden. Uh, and then they, he and his wife hire a, uh, a babysitter uh, to watch their baby. And she's of Mexican descent. And, uh, and she's got an interesting story, too. She uh, seems to feel like she's being followed. And, uh, Constantly wonders if their phone is bugged, uh, always looking over her shoulder. Makes him paranoid too because he's, start, he's already had that um, sort of present. Uh, and, and then they find out that she was actually a <laughs> correspondent for a newspaper in which her editor was murdered and, and there's a price on her head and uh, she's hiding out in this, in this country. So the two of them are not, uh, and her presence in this house reminds him of his own responsibility to to get the manuscript published, even if it means um, trouble for him. Um, at the same time that she also feels a responsibility to try to get back and, uh, or at least reveal herself and write the truth that she knows it, uh, about what's going on there. So that's roughly what's going on. There's a lot more, of course, but uh, those are two of the works that I'm working on right now uh, that um, touch on that and the violence. There is something else. There is a, there's another dynamic at work too, and it's a, it's a fantastical uh, dynamic that I find really fascinating, and, and that, that it seems tailor-made for the kind of work I do. Uh, over the last couple, uh, uh, over the last couple of decades, has been the emergence of, uh, of two, um, uh, in, in, 
Mexico of, of, of these two figures, uh, San Malverde and La Santa Muerte. And they were, uh, they, they just uh, arose as folk religious icons for, uh, for uh, drug dealers and, uh, and people who work in the trade, or even, and even innocent people. Uh, San Malverde is, is the patron saint of, of, of narcos. And, uh, and people pray to him. They set up altars. The Catholic Church doesn't sanction it at all. They try, they try to steer people away from it, but, uh, but he's this uh, gallant-looking figure with a mustache that, uh, that they pray to for uh, uh, an expeditious uh, assignment with successful transfer of goods uh, without any bloodshed. And then there is also the cult of La Santa Muerte, which is which has supplanted the La Virgen de Guadalupe as an icon of uh, of, um, uh, uh, for uh, as an uh, as a feminine icon to whom people wish to um, pray for the same thing for blessings to keep uh, from being killed and. Uh, so my place Icario is going to have a Santa Muerte present as a as a, as a factor in it to guide my my Sicario through these assignments. Um, oh, okay. oh, okay. So those are some of the things I'm working on. Good, thank you. Um, I want to start by asking one question from Octavia, just as a in terms of creating a space for uh, the, I don't know if you identify yourself as a Chicano playwright, Chicano American playwright, and being a playwright that is maybe, um, uh, how have you benefited from the work of the pioneers who have established the Chicano theater in, in, in the US, and then how do you see that journey in terms of uh, a community carving the space for itself um, on the um, Well, I I, uh, I came to um, Chicano work late. Uh, I, growing up, ironically, growing up in El Paso in the high school I grew up, I, I, I grew up going to, and in my undergraduate years of college, there was absolutely no instruction in that. I wasn't really, I wasn't exposed to. Any of that material, it wasn't until after I graduated that I discovered the works of uh, the Royal Chicano Air Force, for instance, uh, a group of poets that did a lot of uh, performance work uh, that was uh, anti war um, and, uh, and spoke eloquently about the issues I cared about, and, uh, and then later uh, learned about Luis Valdez. But it wasn't academically, these were not revealed to me academically. It was the 70s, it wasn't th those programs were just starting to begin and in private universities, I just, they never existed in the theater programs. I was, uh, I was alone. I, I felt very much alone as, as, a, as a Chicano and, 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 and a mostly white uh, institution. I felt like, uh, uh, well, if I was going to be an actor, and that's what I wanted to be at the time, uh, I felt like, well, it seems to be, it seems to me I have to lose my accent have to uh, sound more Midwestern so I can do Shakespeare and act in uh, Chekhov plays, but um, that wasn't going to happen. I could tell it was going to happen, and so I decided to start writing my own works so that I could sort of cast myself in. But, uh, <laughs> and that was a disaster because then everybody said, but those are interesting plays, but you're acting, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I took the hand. And I took the but the, uh, but it's only later that I that I came to know about Luis and, and uh, Teatro de la Esperanza and all those uh, wonderful uh, pioneers of the movement. Uh, and I was very fortunate to have worked with Luis at his theater at the Teatro de la when I did Prospect out there. Yay, these many years ago, 1992, 93, 92. But, uh, but it wasn't part of my initial makeup. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, um, sort of struck by the role of religion in uh, also in uh, Latin America, 
Christian, you know, the forced conversion to Christianity, and then also the way W evoked images of the Crusades as he sort of unleashed uh, the troops on Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and that whole discussion of, I don't know, it's just a, a really complex mix of how religion really plays a role in the way we are to each other. Uh, I'll, I'll open it up to uh, the audience. Questions, please. Mitch? Yeah, question for uh, Rebecca, please. I was uh, following your argument step by fascinating step until the, the very end where you uh, pointed out that the war on drugs uh, is a failure, um, but it's a success in terms of uh, keeping the land in structure. Together. I wonder if you could, who, who's, who is benefiting, who of the landlords is benefiting by the war on drugs? Can you expound on that a bit, please? Well, it's, 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 it's kind of complex as to what the, 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 the ramifications of risk is profiting from, from this, uh, but uh, it's, it, it's mostly sort of the old alliance uh, between uh, American corporate interests and the the oligarchy, the oligarchy, the elites uh, in, in Latin, America's, Latin American countries that either by virtue of businesses associated with them or by virtue of their access and control of power uh, in countries like Guatemala, El Salvador, in Latin America, basically the same 10 or 12 families have had power since the Spanish land. And, um, and these are the people who are, have profited from basically selling out the land uh, to American interests in exchange for perks and, and uh, to a degree for the crumbs of, of uh, and the very, you know, they're pressing a lot of money, of course, and, and access and validation and support. Uh, their children are educated in Oxford and Yale, and, uh, and they come back to continue to Course that, that elite. So in that sense, uh, all over, if you think of places like Colombia, which are sort of emblematic of the war on drugs, uh, where we also have the FARC, uh, which of course are, you know, have, have their own issues, and, 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 and most often you know, the, the campesinos, or the, the, the peasants, are, are caught in the crossfire. But I would say, with, with an understanding that the FARC are no, no saints, that they're also not as bad as they're being painted, because uh, to a degree, a far presence allows the, 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 the peasants to continue to control the land and work the land, whereas when the paramilitary and the, and the army uh, walk in with the war on drugs as, a, as the main excuse, basically they're taking this land uh, uh, away from the peasants, they're passing it on to corporate control, uh, Monsanto and corporations like that are, are, are making tremendous profits and, and, and having access to enormous tracts of land that were, that belong to campesinos, that in being displaced by the war, and Colombia is the, the country with the largest number of displaced people in the world. So that's, if you think of the Middle East as, 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 as some of the most important current conflicts are taking place, <coughs> and, the, and the displacement of people there, or Somalia, Colombia is being first. And uh, so the displacement results in, in empty land that falls into the control of, uh, of uh, corporate interests. So, so that's, 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 a, that's a tremendous success. Uh, it, it's not a failure. And, uh, and I feel it's one of the reasons why uh, you know, they're, they're, they're still after this, and of course there's no interest to, as, and I'll close with this, as in, as in, with immigration, which is obviously deeply connected to all of this. Uh, they never go after uh, the, the corporate interest that hire, the businesses that hire undocumented immigrants. They go after the immigrants. And uh, in, 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 in the war on drugs, the, they, they also don't go into is deeply addressing the issues that make the consumption of drugs an, you know, possible, an issue. Uh, the, the, the addict is, is the market. And, uh, and of course, that's also 
area that, that's murky in many ways, but it's instead of, of, of dealing with, say, well, there is, there's going to continue to be, a, you know, they, they eradicated it from Bolivia and, 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 and Peru, it, 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 it moved to Colombia, now it moved to, uh, and I mean eradicated in some ways, of course, uh, with Evo Morales, there was a backlash for all of that and so forth, but um, they, you know, the, the, the production keeps moving because the consumption, the demand, continues to be okay. So there's no interest in going after that. That's why there's no violence in El Paso. No violence in New York uh, uh, of the, on the scale that we see in, in, in Mexico. It's curious, it's interesting to me how uh, the, 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 the rise of all these cartels and all this violence in Mexico started to really explode at the time that NAFTA was signed. When Bill Clinton signed NAFTA into law, that changed everything. And so many small farmers in Mexico lost their farms, especially those who grow uh, the basic crop names. As super corn was, keep, keeps getting shipped into, into Mexico, all these indigenous farmers are losing their crop. And when they lose it, they lose their livelihood, and they leave, they, they leave these, these villages and turn them into ghost towns and flood toward the, toward the, uh, the border towns or, or large cities to find work, work which, for which they're not equipped, or, or at least to get across, because they know that at least in, in the U.S. there might be opportunities. Um, and there, the attraction to just uh, make a quick uh, $70,000 in a day uh, moving narcotics, it's just too tempting. It, it's so tempting. Um, so uh, it, it's, created, it, it's created this workforce for the, for the narcos that wasn't there before. It's, it's so much more attractive to grow marijuana than it is to grow corn, because the corn is all coming from the U.S as well as other enterprises. Um, subsidized. 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 So, so much for free trade. Yeah. Angela, do you want to add anything to it? There's, uh, it's a long history of this. I, I think what you described in Colombia is exactly what I've heard from activists there. What this war is about, this is not about drugs, it's about land occupation. Um, and the purpose of this kind of basis, the establishment, the U.S. interest, corporate interest, um, the displacement, violent displacement, the exacting kind of proportionate um, move of those populations into cities, into migration patterns, and other things are very, are very well understood there. And I think most activists very much agree with that and understand that. Where they're seeing money being routed into paramilitary interests, in line with government interests in order to obtain huge tracts of land for the cattle industry, for example. So um, I think more people are documenting that. In some ways, interestingly, we just talking about Santos kind of moving to different forms of reconciliation, and, other, and I'm, you know, suspect of that and, and hoping to see a lot more substantiation of a, of a change in rights. And um, I don't, you know, we have to look at where is the United States invested in that? Colombia, Mexico, you know, somewhere else. <laughs> but they were the places where you know, they have been actually um, pushed out of a number of places, you know. Absolutely pushed out, but where the United States is most deeply invested uh, yeah. are the very these places. Are the, uh, these are the allies right now yeah. of, of, of the U.S. Right. in Latin America. Right. There's two yeah, places the with the legacy of this violence. Yeah. The violence also got really bad in, in Mexico when Quinta uh, Fox and Pan came to power. When, when uh, that partido, uh, when that party came to power, it upset uh, one of the uh, with almost the unacknowledged dictatorships that had been ruling Mexico for over 70 years. Uh, and, and Vicente Fox then uh, uh, started uh, sending troops to fight the cartels. Uh, under Felipe Calderón, the next president, it was even worse. He actually declared war on organizations, uh, and that's when the violence got really, really bad, as they were fighting for more turf, uh, and, uh, um, and, as it, and as it sort of upset a kind of, a kind of structure that was already present in Mexico before. Now, the PRI has just gotten back into power, this is a new, new president, Ruiz, Ruiz, uh, uh, Nieto. Uh, Nieto. 
Yes, 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 thank you. Uh, he's a new president with, with Greek, and they're hoping that the policy will change. It'll ease off on the cartels uh, so that they can uh, resume business as usual. Um, and uh, so it's a very complex situation. Uh, there are members of uh, the lower houses of Congress that have been indicted for their implication with the narcos. Uh, the head of the office of uh, uh, the federal police has been indicted for being involved with them. Um, uh, so many officials in, in the government are implicated with a lot of these cartels. How many of them are, uh, 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 are in our government are also implicated with them remains to be seen. But I think uh, I, I think the, that the uh, that the reach is, is deep. Let's see, other questions? Jessica? Please project. Um, I want to thank you, especially Professor Ferreira. I will hope to get a copy of that if it's published anywhere because it is incredibly inspiring. And I'd like to steal it. I'm sorry, a copy of what? Robert, well, Roberto's incredible um, summation of, of all of history. Um, so, <laughs> you sell it to me. Yeah. You are the one who survived. But I really appreciate the, um, the bringing in of history, especially this time in Cordoba, which interests me because it's also a time when Jews and Muslims were somehow living together. Exactly. And part right. of so I think I appreciate bringing, coming back to the theater, how, how you always bring a kind of historical and academic, but not dry academic uh, tilt to this, and to bringing back to the theater the stories that need to be told. So we can have this incredible political, historical discussion, but then what gets put on the stage? So one personal thing I want to say is that Octavio, we were in a um, playwriting workshop in 1990 together at the Eureka Theater when we were both 10 uh, years old and we said children's theater. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, but the one thing I remember so clearly about you as a playwright is your generosity. Is your incredible, you taught me something amazing because I was working on a play about pirate women and you were amazing, and you were um, you were incredibly generous with every single playwright in the room. And it taught, and I never forgot. It taught me something about theater and what is uh, what is actually necessary for us to create uh, across cultures. Um, you, with no real interest, I'm sure, in female pirates, or maybe you had, um, but you were incredibly. Um, invested in the ideas of others, and it seemed to be a revolution of, of um, how theater changes the world. So I just want to thank both of you for bringing your heart and your brain uh, onto the stage, and thank you to both of you too for, for this wonderful and fascinating time. Thank you, we've been uh, asked to wrap up. So I want to thank my panelists um, for a very uh, informative and insightful presentation uh, and conversation. And uh, this is our final panel for, for the Reorient uh, Forum. Uh, we have tonight a, a concert following this, but um, I don't know about you, but I feel like it's been two days of really in, invigorating and thought-provoking conversation. And uh, I'm reminded with this conversation really of um, the ties that bind us that are beyond borders and walls and nationalities and our shared history and how much richer the conversation would be if we moved, you know, reached out to um, affiliate, what was that? Affiliated, what, what did the Hamid say? Web of group affiliation. Web of group affiliation. If there's one thing we want to walk away uh, uh, with uh, this weekend. Um, we have some very uh, informative speakers this, this weekend, both yesterday and today and this morning. Uh, Sarah uh, wrapped up 
yesterday's conversation, so I just want to uh, remind us of the, um, uh, the conversations this morning about um, engaged performance and also mechanisms of protecting artists. I do want to say that um, Theatre Without Borders and Three Dimensionals are program partners to the Orient Forum. Their logo on our website uh, is, or if it isn't, <coughs> will be linked to their website so that uh, by just going to the Reorient page you can find your way to their website and all the amazing information and great work that those two organizations are doing, as well as TCG and TBA and other uh, program partners. We're very grateful to their contribution and um, their source of inspiration. Um, thank you again to the amazing Reorient team and all the people who made time to be with us this weekend. I would invite you to um, stay tonight and enjoy the concert. Hafizim Odizadeh is an amazing musician. I can't tell you how amazing he is. Um, and he's incredible and the work he's doing is Incredible. The way he's mixing jazz improvisation with classical Persian and Arabic music, the risks he's taking musically is just uh, inspiring. So I, I invite you to come back for the concert and there will be a reception and there will be actual food more than bagels and anything <laughs> So uh, hang out, share and celebrate with us the amazing work that we have all together done this past two days and three weeks with the festival. Thank you again for being here and carry on. <laughs>